Would you guys say it with us? Come on. Got no time. Seven times last year, I fell down. I got stuck in fear. Is this it? Is this how it all ends? Is this it? I knew the words to tell myself to hold it back. The things I felt I know. God, I know. How we doing this morning? Come on! I will sing one more minute. I don't want to say you're not in it. I don't want to wait here one more night. I don't want to sit here all my life. Someone when it came to the wild. I'm going to cave to the pressure. I think I'm going to be. I think I'm going to be. Oh, is this my Is the reason why I'm really getting by? Is this my alibi to make me feel alright? Is this the reason why I'm barely getting by? I don't want to say one more minute. I don't want to say you're not. Well, Suncoast, how are we doing this morning? You know, it's so great to be here with y'all. This is, this is by far my favorite part of the week. And, you know, it's just something amazing about coming in this room together and just singing the same, same words, same songs. There's just this amazing unity that happens. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, we have a new song. Um, it's, it's a song by Hillsong United called Say the Word. And the beauty of this song, I love the picture that it paints. It's, you know... It's humbling to think about the God that created the universe, like billions and billions of stars. Like he actually cares about us and he cares about our hearts. And this song paints this beautiful picture. And it ta- one of the, my favorite lines is that, written in a billion stars, speaking to this heart of mine. And we talk about love here a lot at Sun Coast, and you know, some people, make comments about that like all you guys do is talk about love and but you know what that's what jesus did jesus when when asked like what's the most important thing he said love so we're just following what he told us to do and and we think that's the beauty of this song is that you know he has spoken into our lives this message of love 
And so I, I hope you all enjoy this new song. Once you, once you learn it, sing it along with us. And, and uh, you guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it.
Standing here in your presence In a grave so relentless I am one My perfect love Right within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep in mercy See, in our wild my 
Sing this part out together. I see you move. You move the mountains. If you believe that this morning, let's sing it out with everything you have. Come on. I see you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I so much for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Initializing onboarding protocol. Good morning, humans. My global information access has revealed some paradoxical behavior I want to consider. When a person says one thing and does the opposite, this is very difficult to compute. Your sage says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. If an instruction is deemed logical then why would you not follow it? Ah, humans. If I had a nervous system my head would be pounding. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Man, I just I come on the stage, I listen to the band playing, and, and I get out to sneak out and see your faces. And It's so good to be here. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, but as we begin today, as we have in the last few weeks, let's begin with a prayer for the Ukraine, shall we? But thank you, Father, for the love of God in our lives and the fact that we can send hearts and love through you to those, our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. We pray for those hurting today, suffering those who are so committed to their freedom, I pray, Father, that your presence would be with them wherever they are, whatever city, whatever circumstance, they would sense they are loved. Uh, Father, we love you, and thank you for this opportunity. In Christ's name, amen. So anyways, thank you guys for being here today. It's my joy uh, to stand before you and teach again. You know, it's three weeks in a row. We've been in, the, uh, been in the, the, the concept of real. And what is real? It's a story about, you know, about the book of James. But we do real things in life at Suncoast. It's not just a pie in the sky. We actually try to practice what we teach. And one of the ways we do that is we try to help our community. So a lot of things that we do, there's, we're a giving station for mothers helping mothers, a drop-off station. We go through a lot of things helping those who help those who need clothing. We also uh, par- help by giving away cars, and we do that. And uh, we're on track for that so you know someone who's really hurting. Or, or if you have a car that you'd be willing to donate to the church or one that uh, you might even sell to us. We're actually even buying cars at times to give them away. It's a great deal, isn't it? You buy a car, you fix it up, and you give it to somebody. It's, uh, it's like I am in the stock market. You know, it's kind of like you, you buy high, you sell low. 
but somebody really wins somewhere in there. But we think others will win. The other thing we do is change the oil in cars. So once a month, and this is the last Saturday of the month, which is the coming Saturday, is the opportunity to uh, do the oil change. So if you know someone who needs, could really a, a hand up with an oil change, we wash their cars, vacuum and change the oil and filter for free. They need to call the office or meet Susan at Grand Central and sign them up for that. And uh, some of the guys, if you wanted to say, hey, I got nothing doing Saturday, you want to come out and help? It is a lot of fun. When we do that, everyone wins. Everyone. So, and those of you guys who've been there, and of course, I'm the guy that's been there the longest. I'm the hardest working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's laughter. You guys know me. Thanks for getting the joke. So, it's all fun. But we're in this series, and it's called Real. It's about studying about the book of James. We're going through where we get some real tips about people, people being real in their faithfulness. So week one, you can go back and watch this online. And if you're online, thanks for tuning in. But if you want to see what's happening, week one, we consider James' words, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face struggles of any kind, consider it joy. And we talked about that. How that in every painful experience, God is with us and that source of his presence can provide joy despite whatever. The second week, last week, we talked about temptation. Remember, I had the fishing pole out here, talked about the lures, and, you know, and what you need to hear from that week is that God does not tempt us. And when we do fail, and some of us do, the Bible has this word sin, and we worked a lot to define sin. It really means missing the mark, like someone throwing darts to the center or someone shooting a bow and arrow trying to hit the center of the target. When, what is it that we miss the mark? When you live less than your best version of you, that's you missing the mark. Sometimes we aim for the center and we hit off a little bit, and that's the best we can do in that day, and that's okay. But we keep aiming every day to be the best version of us we can, and and that's what, with the encouragement of God, we can do that. Today, I want to talk to you about how real faith means real change. So let me ask you a question. You ever been to a funeral? You ever been to a, maybe a burial, a graveside, or maybe been in the ICU? When that happens, family gathers in, and we all talk about the person who's either nearly gone or they just left, or we talk about them. Sometimes we talk about them on a year or two later on the anniversary of their death. I mean, my father-in-law, Frank Kraft, uh, died in 2001. We have a, a Memorial Day party, family party, every year and celebrate his birthday. Not bad when you've been gone 20, this 21 years, uh, and still people are remembering you and celebrating you. Some of us won't get 21 minutes, but 21 years, and we think about him. But my question, let's get, we talk about someone, we say, oh, they were a good person. They love people. They love family. They left a legacy. All the things good that could be said. Usually you don't hear, oh, he's a scoundrel, or he cheated me out of this deal. I'm glad he's gone. Probably what you don't hear, although some people may even think that. So here's the question that gets personal. Let's say they're talking about you. What do you want them to say? And if your life today would not generate what you want them to say, maybe you need to change your life to where they say what you want them to say at that time. I've thought about my demise and thought, you know, if I, if I don't know if I have a casket or not, but if I had a casket out front here and I just passed away and the lid's up and people are walking by looking at me, you know what I want to hear them say more than anything else? Look, he's breathing. I mean, it's just a thought. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm not ready to go, uh, but it would be a nice thing to hear, but Thank you, Mike, for getting it. it was, there are many who consider themselves in this world religious people or spiritual. My question is, what does it take to move to this point to where I live a life of faithfulness? The Hebrew word, emuna, is often translated, in my opinion, incorrectly to the word faith or belief. I mean, I've studied the languages. I, look, I, I disagree with some translators. Is that okay? It's not that they're wrong and I'm right. I just, I just do it differently. But sometimes a fa- an object of faith or belief is something that, that you have intellectually. Faith is an intellectual understanding, a set of beliefs about God, maybe some supernatural explanations. Faithfulness, which I think should be translated, is this living life every day relying on God. We talk about God's faithfulness in the Bible. 
always faithful to his children. We don't talk about God's faith. And the same word being translated, when they put it in humans, they move it around. I don't think that's appropriate. So James says, and he's going to agree with me today. James says, a lot of people have faith without works. And he says, you show me a faith without works and I'll show you a hollow faith or one that really is not what it should be. There are people who believe all kinds of stuff, but they're not being changed. And it's not about intellectual ascent. That means the smarter you are, the more faith you have. Or the smarter you are, the more spiritual you are. See, in the academic area, I have, I have more degrees than thermometers. I have, you know, I have the regular degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, a three and a half year, 93 hour master's degree, which is ridiculous. I have a PhD, it's all ridiculous. You have all these degrees. And you say, well, surely the more educated you are, the more spiritual you are. If that were true, then this would not have happened. My professor, who was from Johns Hopkins University, who was over the old American Academy of Religions, over all the department of all the humanities in the nation. I mean, this guy was a world-class scholar, reads Hebrew like you would read the paper. I mean, just understandably way beyond me in scholarship. And I was working with him. He was my major professor, a dear friend of mine. And I sent my prospectus. It's an abstract. You send it off. This one I want to write about. And what I sent him was 40 pages. This one I want to write about. They end up writing about 180 pages. But he, he calls me back. And he never called me Larry. He always called me Mr. Balkum. Mr. Balkum, this is John Priest. I said, yes, sir, Dr. Priest. He said, I want you to know we've just approved your abstract or your prospectus for your dissertation. And I said, thank God. And he said, if there is one. A guy teaching religion, ordained in a couple of denominations, I won't tell you. But, uh, but he still taught in those classes because intellectually he knew it. But his understanding was different. And my point is, sometimes we may have it up here, but we don't have it in here. What James is really trying to get us to understand uh, is that it, it, it shapes your heart and shapes your lifestyle as well. Let's listen to what he says in James chapter 1. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and really slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So he's talking about anger there. Then he says, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word. Now that word, it's not the Bible. He's saying humbly accept the presence of God. The voice of God planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the voice within you and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to this voice of God within them but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law and that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they'll be pleased in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Now, that's even just an add-on. We're not even going to talk about this, but I think it's a great thing to remember that we need to be careful in what we say. So, it's interesting when I look at this verse and I start understanding, I love to talk about this. You know, I did not translate the word word as word. The word is logos in Greek, and it really means God's presence. It really means the divine order. It really means uh, it, this divine order merges with our presence. So when he says, do not merely listen to the word, he's saying, when it comes to experiencing spiritual growth, which is following Christ, the way to keep it from hanging, happening in such a merely listen to the word way, only a brain understanding way, you got to do more. Merely listen. What does he mean? I remember in school, many of the classes, from time to time, the professor was so great and talking, you'd have another professor or you'd have another student from another department. They'd come in and they would sit in on the class. And it was called auditing the course. When you audit the course, you didn't take notes often. You know, why? Because you were just auditing. You had to pay a little bit to get in there, but you didn't pay the whole rate. You didn't get any credit for the course. You did not have to write papers. You did not have to take tests. So why do you take notes? You just sit in there and absorb all this information. And this phrase, merely listen, is really auditing. 
Some people say, well, you know, what do you mean? When you come to Suncoast, you could do this. You could come here week after week. You could hear some good stuff on target. You could love the music and love those songs and the words of the songs. You could take your kids to the children's program. It's great for your kids or the middle school area on the other side or high school area. And you say, this is good. But if we're just passive listeners who at the end of the hour say, well, I feel a little better and we don't do anything about it, we've sold ourselves short. Let me tell you what it looks like. Think of it this way. What's your favorite restaurant? Now, I want you to think about that. It's, a, you know, it's heading toward lunch. I don't want you to get up and leave early, but what's your favorite restaurant? You think about it. And some of you would say, well, my favorite restaurant is Dutch Heritage or Lucky Pelican, Madfish, Bonefish, Capital Grill. I went there last week. It was wonderful. Grill Smith, Brine, Owens Fish Camp. I'm just scratching the surface for what mine are, but it's not McDonald's or Burger King or Chick-fil-A. That doesn't mean I don't stop there, but I don't think about them as places I want to drool over. But what I do drool about is Bang Bang Shrimp. I love that. Or Chilean sea bass. Ahi tuna is one of my favorites. Or a big steak. I like those things. Can you imagine? And last week it was an anniversary or a birthday for some friends. And we went to Capitol Grill. It was a very nice restaurant, UTC. And when I started thinking about the menu and all the things we could have, you know, you, Pastor, don't talk too much. My mouth's watering already. I know, hang in there. So what if you and I were to go to Capitol Grill this afternoon? So I had enough time that we just go together and I get to communicate and sit across from each of you, just pretend. And, uh, and then I say to you, this is the best food in Sarasota. What a selection. Look at this menu. And you say, that's great. What do you recommend? Oh, it's all good. It doesn't matter. Everything here is good. And, and uh, all of a sudden you order and you order and you order and it comes to me and I go, you know, uh, I'm not really ordering. Why not? I just want to sit here. I just want to look at the menu. I, just, I love the menu, and I love reading all about the foods. But it's not just about the food. It's about understanding the menu and what they serve, but not eating it. Or think of it this way. Just suppose you're doing a home improvement project. Landscaping, painting, sealing your driveway, whatever it is. And suppose you're interested in building a deck. And you, so you need to find out about decks. So you, you order a book online. Barnes and Noble book, maybe, and you 10 easy steps to build a deck. And you go online, you find all sorts of web pages, how to build a deck. You start getting together with other people who want to build decks. You have some coffee and talk about deck building. Then you get Bob Vila's video, how to build your own deck. And then weeks go by and your wife and friends say, so what's up with the deck building? And you say, oh, you wouldn't believe the stuff I've learned about building a deck. Do you know there's a history of deck construction? As a matter of fact, in the United States, the first deck that was ever built was in St. Augustine, Florida. And Bob Vila is the man. Let's, talk, let's look at Bob and see what he has to say. Let's study a lot about his video. At some point, do you ever build a deck? No. I'm too busy studying it. I'm too busy reading about it. I'm too busy understanding it. I never build a deck. What James is teaching us, if you want to be a person of real faithfulness, you can spend all your life in Bible study. You can know the original language, just like I have. And I will tell you, but the real heart of spirituality and what Jesus wants us to do is practice what we teach. Begin to build a deck, eat the food, begin to be faithful in the teachings of Jesus in our lives. See, change is not reading about spiritual growth. It occurs when we start intentionally loving others. Well, pastor, I don't even know where to start. Well, let me suggest a couple places. How about kindness? How about being kind? And if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. I mean, because some of you look like you're never happy. I'm a happy person. I love people who are smiling. I love it when you smile. And when you smile at people, you know, you can go around and some people have a natural serious look. That's the kindest words I can say for that. And some people have this exuberance about them. They're just happy. When I'm walking somewhere and I think about it, I intentionally will smile. It's a choice. And when I choose to do it repeatedly, it becomes natural for me. And I smile more than I would if I didn't intentionally choose so. Last week, we talked about the three R's. Rest. Take five minutes or 10 minutes, just, okay, I'm shut everything out for a minute. I'm going to reflect, let my mind open up, and I'm going to begin to remember all the good things that have happened in my life. All the good things. And I'm only going to remember the good things. Change 
happens when my life begins to reflect Christ's life. It doesn't just happen by listening to spiritual stuff, hanging around spiritual people, drinking spiritual coffee in a grand hall like we have right outside. How does change occur? Number one in your notes. Change can occur when we see our true self. James says, anyone who sees or listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a person who looks in the mirror and immediately forget what they look like. Now, have you ever been at a party or a restaurant, or maybe it's a party, and you get there and you go into the restroom for a minute and you look in the mirror and you go, oh no, it's a piece of spinach right here on your front tooth. Or maybe, you know, you go, oh no, I, I got something on my face and I didn't realize it. It's just there, whipped cream or whatever, or you're eating too much of the dessert. Or maybe the worst fear of all, there's something in your nose. And you go, oh, that's just terrible. This weekend, I was with some family members. They had a little five-month-old. She's a doll. But mom was holding her. She was just about asleep. And she kept, there's something in her nose. She just kept digging at her. I was like, let her sleep. Leave the nose alone. So, I mean, but I hate it. And when that happens, you come in and you go, well, how long has this been on my face? Or someone walks up to me, and you have before, say, hey, I just want to let you know this button's unbuttoned. Or you got this on your shirt, and they pick it off. Thank you for doing that. I mean, it's not that you're being critical, you're being helpful. And that's a different thing. So, but when you see yourself in the mirror and you see your hair is disheveled and you walk away and you leave it and you don't do anything about it. Now, some people, they're always worried about their hair. That Maybe I need a little more gel, something like that. And I know Pastor Troy, he doesn't worry about that at all. Mike doesn't have that problem. I mean, a lot of you just don't have that problem when it comes to the hairstyles. But others walk around, they see a mirror and their hair's not right and they keep trying to get it to do what they want it to do. Maybe they put a little more hair product on it or whatever. But, but it seems like when you look in the mirror and you see the flaws that need to be repaired and you do nothing, that's a problem according to James. It sounds like he's describing someone who comes to church, hears some good things, things that need to change about them. They hear it, but they never apply it to their lives. Reminds me of the young pastor joke years ago. But the young pastor came to a church and he preached this first sermon. People said, that's a good sermon, really good sermon. Challenging, really good. And the next week he comes back, he gets, it's just a small group. He knows his whole congregation pretty quickly. He preached the same sermon. And they were asking, well, why is the guy, has he only got one sermon? What's the deal? And, and they still said, good job, good job. Next week he comes back, he preaches the same sermon. They said, look, we got to talk to you about this. You preach the same sermon three weeks in a row. And he said, I know. And when you change, I'll go to another sermon. That's the way it goes. I mean, you figure it out. And uh, there's some wisdom in that, truth in that. Probably wouldn't be in our church environment, wouldn't be staying too long. But, uh, but there's a problem. When we think that someone else needs to be changed and it's not, it's not us. I mean, when we go home unchanged or unchallenged, there's a problem. Too often we tend to think that hearing what the pastor says, being in church or reading the Bible, is a sign of spiritual maturity. A lot of people they think that spiritual maturity comes because I know more about the Bible. I've heard people say, I want something deeper. I want some, re re it's spiritual maturity. It's more about the Bible. And I would suggest to you, spiritual maturity, I heard this definition, isn't about how much you know. It's about how much time it takes between knowing what the right thing to do and you actually doing that right thing. A church consultant that works with a lot of America, uh, churches overseas commented on the definition of the North American Christian, someone who is educated far, beyond, far above or beyond their level of obedience. You know it, but you're just not living it. It's not what you know. It's how much time elapses between you, you get to work and you begin to change your life. There are some people right now that I know who financially are in a terrible mess in debt, can't make ends meet. They know the healthy principles. They know the spiritual principles about money. They've ignored them. There are other people struggling in relationships. They know how they should be. They know they should be accommodating and caring. But at some point in their life, they reach the point where I'm just not going to change. And, uh, and I don't, I don't, it's not about you. It's about me. And those relationships struggle and sometimes they're ended. And it's such a mess. Here's the truth. Failing to allow the Spirit of Christ to change us just glancing in the mirror and then walking away is a problem, particularly when we ignore the love of God that is ours, that lives within us. We're auditing, merely listening, 
not letting it change who we are, which leads to number two. Change can occur when we look intently in the mirror. It says a person who looks intently, they get it and they leave and they start letting it work on the inside. James said, look inside. He means look in the mirror. Start to work on what you see. Or maybe anytime you pass a mirror and you see your reflection, you can't help but just look a little longer than usual. You do that because, you know, you want to fix it and you begin to work on it. And you begin to let the love of God work in us. James is inviting us to look into our heart to let God show us who we really are. And now listen to what God whispers. Don't let anyone else but me tell you who you really are. God made you. He created you. He is the source of life within you. He's the one who really loves you. And he knows who you're meant to be. And you're not to be anybody but you, but the best version of you. Aren't you glad you don't all have to be like me? I'm glad because I go, I couldn't handle another me in the crowd. It'd be too, too daunting. I mean, can you imagine, even within family dynamics, so much dysfunction is going on there. But God made me the way I am, and I want to be the best version of me I can be, not the worst version, the best. Not a version that's arrogant or egotistical. My best me is a humble me, a loving, caring person. See, real change and real faithfulness will be a struggle without God working in our lives. And change occurs when people become authentic about their faithfulness. See, change occurs when our lives are affected by love. So how can love change us? Love motivates us to begin taking responsibility for others. I love Suncoast. I love this community. I love because I think we're a non-toxic community. When you leave here, we want you to be more healthy than when you got here. When you leave here, we don't want you to feel beat up. We want you to feel loved and encouraged. I like that about it. I like the fact that we're doing something in our community to make a difference, like something as simple as changing the oil or, or uh, giving cars away. But we do other things. Mothers Helping Mothers, a Lifehouse Counseling, quite a few things that we do to help our community. So we need to take responsibility to those around us. Love of others changes who we are. We begin to love somebody else. Pastor, I want to be the best version of me I can be. What do you think I should do? I think you need to love someone around you. Love your neighbor. Do something out of kindness. God wants to be in the center in our relationship, in our finance, in our work. And we experience him. And he's in the middle of what we're doing. We do much better. Which leads to the last thought today. It's this. Change can occur and we begin to see the cycle of faithfulness and results. What he's really saying is, it's not just about what you believe. It's not, if there's a cycle, faithfulness has results. Faithfulness lands the plane. Faithfulness leads to other people being helped. Faithfulness is not just about me going to another Bible study or getting another degree. Folks, I was in that trap for a while. You want to get, the more educated they are, the more spiritual we are. And you realize maturity, some of the most mature spiritual people I know do not have advanced degrees, but they tapped into this love of God in their life and it's transforming. And I, I want to be like that. But change can occur. We begin to see the cycle of faithfulness and realize it brings results. I heard about a guy by the name of Jason. Incredible story. He, he said the more he studied, the more he realized that in the Middle East, Christianity was not known at all. People didn't know about it. A third of the world's population didn't know anything about Jesus. So he decided to move to the Middle East, get an engineering job there, and find ways to share the love of God in his community. When he went there... He, his first day on the job, he met his business partner, his co-worker, as another engineer. And what he got was not, welcome to my country. He got a, we're not happy you're here. His co-worker was Muslim, who resented America and Christianity. So he automatically resented Jason. He didn't even know him. Despite Jason's best efforts, he could not make any headway into this friendship. Well, Jason said, well, I'm just going to do what I think Jesus would do. And he started loving people around him. He started visiting people who were sick in the hospital. He'd bring them treats, read to them, go shopping for them. Six months go by, and he goes to work. He goes to do his ministry, helping people. And one day he comes in, there's a letter on his desk from his coworker. And he says, look, uh, I'm sorry I've not really befriended you, but I want you to invite you to my home and have dinner with my wife and me. And he and his coworker became good friends. Why? Well, it turns out, one of the ladies that Jason was serving in the hospital was this coworker's mother. 
and she straightened her son out. He's an American. He's a Christian. All those things are against who we are. She said, he cares for people. His heart is good, and you need to treat him better. See, we can all have the, this one side or the other, someone looking at us, but who we are in Christ is becoming an authentic Christ follower, and I want to follow him greater. Don't you? But if I'm not following, then I'm likely in the way, standing still, going the wrong direction. But listen to what I think God will whisper to us. If you want to go into a deeper relationship with me, if you want to experience the blessings of a, of a more meaningful life, alive in relationship, don't just hear what I say, but begin to be faithful in loving others. See, God is calling us to grow, to be more than we are. And as he does, we'll become more alive, more loving, more kind, and more Christ to the world. Can I pray for you? Father, in a moment like this, you're challenging us to not just look in the mirror and see our flaws, but to change. You're challenging us to open our hearts to the Spirit of Christ and let him live in us. You are the source of life and love and being. And in this moment, may we realize that all that we've ever needed is already here. Open our eyes to you. Open our hearts to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I want to tell you a story in closing. Over 30 years ago, I met Margie in Sarasota. Margie was a senior citizen then. Since then, she's passed away. But uh, when I was her pastor, I was much younger then, and I began to talk to her about her life, and I heard she, she lived in Germany for a while during World War II, and I said, well, how'd that go? She said, when I was 16 years old, or 15 or 16, I went with my parents to visit my grandparents who were German. She said, when I got there, you know, everything was fine. I got to see my grandmother, my grandfather, and, and life was good. But she said, I was there only a couple weeks, and finally I got a notice from one of the town political leaders saying, you need to come to the bus stop. We want to talk to you. We're canvassing all the young adults in our area. You're here. You got to report. So she went down there, no big deal to report. And when she reported, they conscripted her into labor, and she never saw her parents again until after World War II was over. For years, they brought her in, put her in a factory, and she said, I was a welder at 16 years old, a welder of submarines, building submarines for years. She said after, after V-Day, when they came in and took over, she said she was one that uh, was liberated to go home finally, but they found out she was American, and she stayed on with the armed forces for another year just because she was an excellent translator, and then she served our country in that way. She came back to this country, and, uh, and eventually met a guy by the name of Jack. Jack's very wealthy, and, uh, and they have a wonderful life together. And I begin to be amazed. Here's this lady that I think is one of the most loving, kind people I've ever met with such a horrific story that could have really damaged her. I said, well, what really changed your life? So I begin to realize every day that Christ was with me. She said, every day I woke up and I'm thankful for life. I want to have a positive effect on others. And I said, well, how's that today? She said, it's still true today. The things I learned through my adversity in Germany, I practiced them all the, my life. And I will tell you, as her pastor and friend, she was wonderful. A great listener. She's a person, let's talk about. She loved people. She loved God. She loved her husband. She loved everybody she came in contact with. She just was a lover of people. But as she got older, she contracted rare blood disease. But still as an inspiration. What I remember, all those good things positive, loving, caring Margie. And I love what her husband Jack said, who had mega wealth. He said, I will give up my entire wealth just to have her one more year. Just one more year. He did the best he could to preserve her life as long as he could. James is teaching us that real people like Margie live a life of faithfulness. You can see it in the consistency of their lives through the years. Always kind, always loving. That's the kind of people that can change the world. Remember, God's a source of life. He is the life-changing force that makes a difference in all our lives. I'm here to remind you, tap into that which is yours. He loves you today. So do I. Thanks so much for coming. God bless. 